And let's start with the most important bit of ovarian cancer, and that's surgery, because I'm a surgeon. Right. <laughs> I'll walk between the two screens, and hopefully this, this button will work. The title of this talk is Advances in Cancer Surgery, but actually I'm not going to talk about advances in cancer surgery. I'm actually going to talk about three things. I want to talk about the history, because I don't think you can understand surgery until you understand the history. I'm going to talk about current practice, and then I'm going to talk about some new developments. In Yvette's talk, which will come soon after mine, she'll talk about the evolution of a drug, and she'll talk about the fact that it's taken 20, 30 years to get a drug to market, and you'll think that's a long time. The story I'm going to tell is much longer. It goes back about 150 years. And we really need to get this in our heads to understand where we've come from. So the first question I want to ask is, why do we actually operate on cancer at all? And I mean any cancer. And the reason we do is, is really down to this chap, uh, William Halstead, who was a surgeon in, in the United States in the latter half of the 19th century. And Halstead operated on all sorts of cancers, particularly breast cancer. And he began to realize he could cure a proportion of patients with surgery, but he couldn't cure all of them. And despite the fact he tried harder and harder and harder, he could still not cure all patients of breast cancer with surgery alone. And he began to realize that there were certain criteria that you had to set. And he came up with what's become known as Halstead's principle, that if you're going to operate on a cancer, really you have to be confident that you can remove the whole of the tumor with a clear margin of tissue around it and the relevant lymph node supply. And that's pretty much the principle that we stick with now for nearly all cancers. Uh, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, if you're going to have an operation, it's to try and achieve that. And when people talk about inoperable cancers, they're not truly inoperable. We could remove them, but the point is removing them would not do any good and it wouldn't um, achieve any benefit. So that's Halstead's principle, and it's followed by pretty much every oncology surgeon in the UK, except for ovarian cancer surgeons. And that's because of this. So most of you will know this, that most ovarian cancers present at an advanced stage. So on the left-hand side of this table, you can see stage one, two, three, four. One is when it's confined to the ovary. Two, three, four is when it's spread outside of the ovary. For stage one cancers, then I would agree that Halstead principle pretty much applies. We can pretty much cure those cancers with surgery alone. We sometimes give chemotherapy as well as a backup, but it's really the surgery that does the job. But for stage two, three, and four cancer, and look at the percentages, that's most of those tumors, they present already spread outside the ovary. So they don't really fit into Halstead's principle. So the real question is, why do we operate on those non-Halsteadian tumors? Because many of you will have had tumor that is greater than a stage one, and yet you'll have had an operation. And from what I've just told you, that doesn't really make sense. So the reason that we operate on those tumors is down to this <coughs> observation. And I'm going to take you through this. So when we operate on patients with advanced disease, at the end of our operation, we can classify them into one of three groups. We can say there are those patients where we have completely cytoreduced to reduce the disease. That means we've removed everything that we can see. There is no disease left that we can see with the naked eye. Doesn't mean to say there aren't microscopic cells, but we've taken everything we can see. Then there's the middle group where we've optimally cytoreduced to reduce them. We've removed everything except for small little bits. And then there's suboptimally cytoreduced to reduce where we've still not been able to remove larger bits of disease. And way back in 1975, now my pointer's gone. Can you move us on? Because, uh, there we are, yeah. Back in 1975, a chap called Griffiths observed that the patients on the left-hand side, those that have complete sight reduced, did better in terms of their overall survival than the ones in the middle, and they did better than the ones on the right-hand side. And that observation has been seen in every single series that's ever been looked at. I looked at my own data yesterday, for the last four years, I can show you that pattern in our patients that we treat. If you get completely sight reduced, survival is always better than if, if you leave disease behind. But it begs a really interesting question. And the real question is, is it the surgery that matters? So is it those patients do better because we <coughs> did remove the disease or simply because we could remove the disease? Was there something about those particular tumors that made them much easier to operate on and to be able to remove? So you could argue that there's a question here between whether it's the surgery that's important or it's the underlying biology of the disease that's important. And that's a really important question to try and answer because if it's the biology of the disease that matters, then we shouldn't be operating because the, bio the surgery is not really changing anything. But if it is the surgery that matters, then clearly we should be operating. So it's a really important question. How do you answer important questions in medicine? You should do a randomized control trial. So what we should do is take all of our patients and randomize them into either having surgery or not having surgery. And that would tell us the answer. But you can pretty much guess we're not going to do that, right? We've talked about it. There's no way we're going to do that trial. So we're stuck with a problem that we do surgery and we need to try and prove whether it works. 
So, I'm going to try and take you through some of the evidence that we have. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you how complicated it is sometimes to try and get the answers to these kinds of questions. So I want, to, I want you to imagine we have two doctors. We have Dr. Wiz and we have Dr. Steady. Dr. Wiz is one of those sort of surgeons. He likes to remove absolutely everything he can. It doesn't matter where the disease is. He'll go for it and try and take it out, take out large bits of disease everywhere else he can. Dr. Steady is one of those sort of doctors who operates to remove most disease, but he wants to try and avoid complications. He wants to be really safe. So he's a little bit more cautious and therefore he's more likely to leave disease behind than is Dr. Wiz. In Dr. Wiz's group of patients, therefore, most of his patients have all of their disease removed. He has a very high rate of that complete site of reduction. Lots of his patients get completely site reduced. Whereas in Dr. Steady's case, quite a lot of his patients uh, leave disease. He has a low rate of complete site of reduction. Now let's just imagine that this is all down to biology and surgery is important. So if biology is true and the surgery is not, then there shouldn't be any difference between the survival between those two groups, okay? Because it's the biology that determines it, not the surgery. So if we imagine that, then can we look at that? And yes, we can. A chap called Bob Bristow did this about 15 years ago now. And what he did was he looked at everybody's series that he could find, and he worked out the Dr. Wizzes and the Dr. Steadies, and he plotted them all on a graph, and that's the graph you can see on the left-hand side. Each little circle represents a, an individual doctor's series, the Dr. Wizzes are all on the right hand side, they get high rates of complete site reduction. The Dr. Steadies are all over on the left hand side and everybody else arrayed between. And you can see that the graph goes upwards, because on the y axis that's how much patients survive. So the Dr. Wizzes of this world are getting better survival than the Dr. Steadies of this world. So removing disease does seem to make a difference. There are some caveats to that, it's still not a randomised controlled trial, but it's really the best we've got. And it plots out onto the graph on the right hand side, which means if you go from really not achieving very high cytoreductive rates at all to very high, you can improve survival quite significantly for patients. So on the basis of that, we believe surgery probably is important. Here's a little bit more valid, validating sort of evidence for that. This comes from a single hospital. This was the Memorial Sloan Kettering. There are lots of other hospitals that have done the same now. And what they did was they, they looked back at their data. And this is old, but it's really important. So in the little box there, you can see 1996 to 1999, when they looked back at their patients, only 54% of their patients had completely cytoreduced um, disease. So only in about half their patients were they getting all the disease out. They changed their practice. They said, look, this isn't good enough. We need to do something else. And they put into place a whole series of events to improve their surgery. They worked with colleagues, they worked harder, they got more operating time, they got better ITU facilities. They did lots and lots of things in their hospital to make their surgery better. And you can see they transformed that so that by 2000 to 2004, they'd reduced that suboptimal rate right down to about 20%. So they changed their surgical practice. What happened to their survival? And this is the only complicated graph I'm going to show you, but I'll just talk you through it. The important one is really the bottom right graph here. And what that shows you is the survival of their patients. These are called Kaplan-Meier survival curves. You look at them by saying on the left-hand side at the top is all of your patients at the start. And as time goes along, this is the proportion that's surviving with time. The real way to look at the graph is the higher the graph, the better it looks. So what you can see here is that the bottom line, this is their old cohort, the 1996 to 1999 patients. And then when they change their surgical practice, the line goes up, which means that the survival is better when they change their practice. So within one hospital, changing their surgical practice improved the outcome for their patients. And just to give you a little idea, this is just a graphical representation that's the graph we've just been looking at. That's the similar graph for the effect of bevacizumab. And you can see bevacizumab, better than control, there's a little bit of a gap, but I'm going to argue that the gap for surgery is bigger than that. So I would argue that surgery is the single most important thing you can do in terms of improving the outcome for your patients. And arguably is better than bevacizumab, but I'll let Yvette argue that back later on. Does it work for us? This is data that um, came out of my hospital in Gateshead when I was working up there. We had our epiphany moment in 2002. So we took all that data that I've just shown you and we changed our practice. And you'll see that the pink line, which is our complete site reduction rate, started to go up. Our suboptimal rate, which is the turquoise line, went down. As we improved our surgery, so did the block bars. They're the survival of our patients. So as we changed our practice in surgery, our patients started to do better and better. There were still problems with geographical variations. This is data, I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but it's really just to point out that we have looked across the country and there are widely differing 
surgical practices across the country. This is all data now, this is about 12 years ago. And many of these problems have been ironed out by looking at our data and co constantly auditing it and trying to see what we do. So I think we can say we've come from a position where we now begin to understand that surgery is genuinely important. It's taken us a long time to get there because we weren't able to do the randomized control trial that really would have answered the question a lot quicker. There were good reasons for not doing that, but we've had to sort of find secondary evidence to support it. But we've got to the position where if you're going to have an operation, the more disease that is removed, the better. And that really becomes the mantra of our surgical approach for ovarian cancer. But that leaves one big question. When should you do it? So now let's look at the sort of present and where we are now. So traditionally, we've taken patients who have advanced disease, we've done an operation to remove as much as we can, and then we've followed up with chemotherapy, usually in the form of six cycles. Yes, there are variations, but that's been the sort of standard of care over the years. And the question that was asked some years ago now was, would it be better to give some of the chemotherapy first and then do the operation? So take a patient, give them three cycles of chemotherapy, then do an operation to remove what's left, and then finish off with the final three cycles of chemotherapy. You'll see that the treatment load is the same whichever way you go. You're still going to get an operation and six lots of chemo, but the scheduling is different. And that was one we did test in randomized trials. So we've tested it in two randomized controlled trials now. One was reported um, in the New England Journal, that came out from Europe, and then one was reported in the Lancet, that was a main UK study called Chorus which recruited quite a long time ago now, but was still very important. I won't take you through the graph, but the bottom line of that was that the survival in both sides was pretty similar. There were very few differences actually, depending on which way you went. So we now have a position where actually both of those um, strategies are entirely appropriate. The challenge we have as an individual team of doctors looking after a patient is to try and decide, for my individual patient, are you better to go down the left-hand route or the right-hand route. And I think if there's a single unanswered question we have about surgery at the moment, it's how to make that decision. There are lots of us, including my own group, who are working really hard to try and develop tests that will predict which patient gets the most benefit from the left-hand side and which type of patient gets the most benefit from the right-hand side. But it's fair to say at the moment, we don't have a good way of doing that. And it is a little bit arbitrary. It does mean that some units around the country have a much higher rate of going down the left-hand side and some units have a much greater rate of going down the right-hand side. The bottom line is it probably doesn't matter a huge amount, um, but you wouldn't believe that if you came to our conferences where we argue about it, because we do argue vociferously. Anyway, the European Society of Family Oncology has taken this on now. It's now produced a set of standards, which many centres in the UK are working towards getting accreditation. I think this is really important. And it's, a, it's been a mantra across surgery, across so many disciplines. You can think about heart surgery in children and other examples where bringing in standards has driven up the quality of care. And I think this is another example of where we've got now a good body, ESGO, who are beginning to recognise what constitutes good surgery and recognising that. So we're seeing real improvements in the quality of surgery across the UK and elsewhere. I think what's really important is this kind of data. Um, I just got all of this yesterday. This is my data or my, my hospital's data for the last four years. And I'm not going to take you through it, but the point is we are now tracking every single one of our patients to see what we've done with them and to see what the outcomes have been. So we know exactly what our rates of good surgery are, what our rates of suboptimal site reduction are. And I'll just remind you, do you remember that Memorial Sloan Kettering had a suboptimal rate of 54% back in the year 2000? Ours is 12% for those who have primary surgery and 7% for those who have neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So you can see how much surgery has changed in 15 years. We've brought those numbers right down to, to much better places. So now we know we've got to the present. We know that surgery can be carried out first or after chemotherapy, but we still need to decide how to select. So in the last couple of minutes, I'm really going to start looking into other areas. If surgery is so good first time round, then will it work for recurrent disease? And I wanted to really just finish off by showing you two slides and just talk you through where we are with surgery for recurrent disease, because I think that's, that's a really big question. So this is a very complicated slide, and I have copied it piecemeal, um, really just to show you a little bit about how we design trials and how we look at trials and some of the important things about this. So this is a trial called Desktop 3, and Desktop 3 has now been published and reported. We all know about it, so it's out in the open. This was a study that was run by the German group, that's the AGO, I can't remember what that stands for, but it's the something, a guy in college group in, in Germany. And this was their trial schema. And what they decided to do was take patients who had disease that had come back, so recurrent disease, and they would do a randomized control trial, which was easy to do because we didn't really have a standard of care here. 
and they would randomize patients either into having surgery, which would be followed by chemotherapy, <coughs> or they would just have chemotherapy alone. So that's a really important question to ask. The key to this though was, this was the desktop three study. And the desktop three study means there was a desktop one study and a desktop two. What did one and two tell us? Well, there was some really good preliminary work during which they worked out which patient groups they specifically wanted to put into this trial. And they worked out that there were some criteria that you could uh, meet that would mean that patients are much more likely to get a good outcome. So the key to the desktop study was it wasn't open to all patients. It was open to those patients who had recurrent disease and who met what are called the AGO criteria. And to simplify that, those patients had to have had at least six months out from their first chemotherapy before the disease came back. They had to have had complete cytoreduction reduction at their first operation. They had to not have the presence of ascites or the fluid back in the tummy. And they had to have disease that the surgeon was confident he could remove. And if they met all those criteria, then they met the criteria to go in the trial. And that's really important when we start to think about how we interpret the study. So that was the trial. It took 408 patients across Europe, including from the UK. We put some in um, from the UK into that study. And what did it show? Well, the end point of the study wasn't overall survival. It wasn't how long the patients would live. It really only looked to see how long it would be before the disease came back again. So that's really important. This is not testing how long patients live. It's just testing um, how long it was before the next recurrence. Nevertheless, Patients who had chemotherapy only, so that was the sort of standard care if you like, they went on average 14 months before their disease came back. But when they had an operation in the chemotherapy, that went up to 20 months. So on average, a six month improvement. You can argue, and that's something we discuss with our patients, is that appropriate to have a big operation for, for that amount of benefit, but that's something we can discuss on an individual basis. But remember, this only applies to those patients who meet the criteria to go on in the trial. So it's not every patient by any means, but it is for some. But I think this is really important for two reasons. One, it means we've got now a new treatment. We can offer this surgery to patients because we know it has an effect. And secondly, I think it also shows we can do randomized control trials of surgery in ovarian cancer. And having got confidence in that, it means we can do more and more of those sorts of trials. And there are others now being developed. So that's really where I was going to leave it, just to say that Surgery is a hugely important part of the treatment of ovarian cancer. We talk a lot, and the press talks a huge amount about new drugs, you know, this drug versus that drug, getting this drug onto, onto formula and so on. But actually, we mustn't forget about the role of surgery in all of this. It's important now in first line, and it's now important in the current disease. And this does have implications because we have to make sure our hospitals are capable of doing that surgery, not only technically, but in terms of resource. Have we got enough theatre time? Have we got enough surgeons? And so on and so on. We've got some major challenges. The major challenges are to ensure quality. It's really important that every hospital in the UK that's offering ovarian cancer surgery is doing it to the standard that we need it to be. We need to keep those suboptimal rates really low and have really good high quality surgery. We need to ensure access. We need to make sure patients can get the, the operations when they need them in a timely manner. And particularly in the recurrent setting, are they getting referred back for surgery? And then really key to me is we need to develop those predictive tests to decide who will benefit from surgery the most and what that surgery should be. Should it be before chemotherapy or be midway through chemotherapy? So that's a bit of a rattle through surgery for ovarian cancer. 150 years ago, the story starts. This is where we are now. We're in a lot better position than we were 10 or 15 years ago. And that's really exciting, but there's still quite a lot to do. So I don't know whether you want to leave questions till after. Yes, we'll leave questions just for now. Um, I'll hand back to Anwin and then we'll address some of those questions later on, but thank you very much. Thank you.